So questions we're going to be discussing today are, um, you know, well, what next? Where is Britain going? To quote Kotsky. Uh, we have, you know, uh, economic crisis, we have Brexit negotiations, we have a uh, incredibly weak government. Will we see another election in another six months? Will we see, uh, you know, let's say perhaps a Labour Party or Tory Party split? Will we see, you know, who we know? Who knows? We'll try and uh, give us some idea. And so these are all the things we're going to be discussing. And most importantly, you know, where does this put the perspective of actually, you know, um, building socialism in Britain? That's ultimately the question. What will we be able to do to uh, continue and actually push for this goal? So we've got James, who's come all the way from London after a busy night watching the results to uh, come and talk. Uh, he is editor of Socialist Appeal. Uh, we've got a few copies there. Uh, next one will be printed on Monday with the uh, new results, so uh, slightly outdated at this point. Uh, but he's going to be giving the talk. Um, he's come all the way from London, so uh, you know, we will be looking at the end to try and uh, cover his travel costs and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, actually, we think that's it. Uh, just one more thing before we start. We are also, as a Marxist society, getting involved in the Save Our Statue campaign. Uh, which is a current campaign run by UCU, the University College Union, on effectively saving Statue 24, which is um, a statue put in place to effectively make it harder for staff to be redundant. Uh, Barnaby, do you want to say a few words on if people are interested in getting involved or what you'd like to know? Uh, yeah, so at this point we're just hoping to publicise it more. Um, obviously there's a few things being discussed at the moment. I think the key thing at the moment is it, management is trying to change the status of this Statue 24 make it easier to get rid of, and then consequently when they got rid of that, to make it easier to make stuff in London, and that could have quite a damaging effect on academic freedom. The key thing about Statute 24, of course, is that you know, an academic can say something, of course, that's controversial, and he's not going to be fired by it because it looks bad at the university. So this is obviously not very important for the academic staff, for working for people generally, but it's also very important for us as students to get the po best possible education, uh, insofar as we require that academic freedom to have a worthwhile education. Yeah. Uh, so again, if we can like just raise awareness about that campaign, we'll be sharing a few stuff and actions we do at the end. Uh, if you're interested, please talk about Barnaby. And um, yeah, so uh, James is going to give a talk, probably about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to have an open discussion. People feel free to ask questions about the election, if you have opinions, uh, you know, criticise, etc. And just have a discussion uh, for about some time after that, until we all get bored. And then head to the pub afterwards, discuss it in more detail with some drink and some food. So, uh, thank you very much, and uh, without further ado, uh, James. <coughs> right, just before I start, I thought I'd check there's no Tories in the room. <laughs> okay. well, uh, yeah, so much for their strong and stable government. Uh, I think what we've seen is the most incredible seven weeks that I can really remember. Uh, you had the, conf the Tories confidently calling this election. Uh, they, th they thought they'd absolutely smash it. You know, they're full of complete hubris. Uh, they thought they'd turn their shallow majority of, uh, of 12 into well over 100. Uh, all the political commentators were thinking this. If you had all the media, they were saying, oh yeah, it's going to be a Tory landslide. Uh, you know, they're going to face down the hard Brexiteers. They're, going to, they're doing this to try and avoid a crisis with their own party. Uh, because they're ultimately going to be forced to have to, to compromise with the EU to get some kind of deal. And with this tiny majority of 12, the, the party is extremely unstable. Because there's a whole layer in there and you don't want any compromise whatsoever. So that's why May really called that, I think. But they also thought they're going to get a much stronger government, they're going to be able to carry out a much harder attacks against the working class. Uh, but also, they, I think they completely misjudged the mood. Uh, and I think what we've seen uh, yesterday, or rather overnight, is uh, it's fair to call it one of the biggest political upsets in British history. And because uh, they thought they had this 20 point lead over Labour, they thought that it was uh, unshakable. Uh, they thought that they were going to be really clever, they thought they were going to absolutely smash Labour. They, uh, many of them talked about uh, you know, putting the, the boot into Labour once and for all, and that you know, the party would never recover, you would have years or decades of uh, Tory rule. Uh, they, they just simply mechanically assumed that the UKIP vote would now collapse now that Brexit's uh, taking place, and would just move over wholesale into the Tories, giving them a whopping majority. And they all thought, they, I think a lot of them genuinely believed that Corbyn was a complete no-hoper. You know, they thought he wasn't going anywhere, they all believed this uh, mantra that he's unelectable. And uh, they had the entire weight of the establishment media as well on their side to, to back this up and to, to peddle this kind of idea. And uh, <clears throat> also they had the Blairites, i.e. the kind of Tory agents within the Labour Party as well, carrying, like, fighting their side, undermining him every day, trying to sabotage his uh, programme and so on. So they thought it would be a complete shilling. 
The result, as we all know, though, has been uh, the complete uh, opposite. This has massively backfired. Uh, this, this calculation of May has completely blown up in her face. Uh, they've had a net loss of 12 seats. Remember, Theresa May uh, tweeted not so long ago that if she lost six seats, she would lose <coughs> the election. Uh, she's lost much more than that. They've thrown away their majority. They didn't even need to call this election. Uh, they've been reduced to 319 seats in Parliament. As a result, Theresa May is completely discredited now. Uh, it's very likely, I think, she'll have to resign at some point. I don't want to say necessarily immediately, uh, but I think she's clearly lost of her authority, both with uh, the wider public, but also within the, the Tory party. We've had leading ministers coming out on the TV and the radio today calling her to, uh, for her to step down. And although, uh, <clears throat> although Corbyn obviously doesn't have a majority, they you know, haven't won the election in that kind of conventional sense, they're not, they're not about to form a majority government, uh, I think Corbyn was right when he said that Labour were the obvious winners from this election. And I would go further from that, I would say it's not just Labour that won this election, <coughs> but it was Corbyn and his supporters. There's a huge layer within the Parliamentary Labour Party who did not want to win this election, and actually <coughs> fought against uh, Corbyn winning this election. And I think that we can fair to say that this uh, Corbyn's campaign has completely transformed British politics. I mean, nothing's going to be the same again after this. Uh, we've had you know, decades of Tory-like policies coming from the Blairites, uh, you know, policies of privatisation, uh, war, austerity and so on. Uh, and Labour really has hemorrhaged support ever since 1997, uh, which that election, we should be clear, was won despite Blair, not because of him. I think anybody would have won that election after over a decade of uh, Tory rule. And now, uh, what's uh, the result? Labour actually got over 40% uh, of the, uh, the, the vote share, which I think, according to the political commentators, is the largest turnaround in election history in Britain. Although they, they haven't found any other swing uh, uh, comparable to that. And uh, <clears throat> significantly higher than the 30.4% won by Miliband in 2015. It's much higher than the 29% uh, the won by Gordon Brown. And it's even higher than the 35% won by Tony Blair in 2005. If you actually look at the number of votes as well, Blair in that election got 9.5 million votes, and yet he's the one that the Blairites are holding up as the model, and uh, sort of saying that that is the benchmark for Corbyn, uh, otherwise he has to go. And uh, actually Corbyn this time got 12.8 million votes, and that's actually 2 million votes more than Tony Blair got in the so-called landslide election of 2001. Now, uh, <clears throat> I think this has happened, is really the election, uh, Far from what the Tories hoped, wasn't just simply about Brexit. Uh, I think even before the election, that wasn't really the main issue in British uh, society. And uh, even if you go to the Brexit vote itself, I think you've got to be clear that the, the vote didn't represent some suddenly 17 million people like voting for, for racism or, um, and things like that. I think at, a, at its core, it was a, a massive backlash against the establishment, against the status quo, and against things like massive unemployment, you know, decades of deindustrialization. Uh, stagnant or falling wages, the chronic housing crisis, uh, you know, complete corrupt elite, all the kind of scandals that have rocked the establishment over the years. All these kind of things led to this kind of uh, outpouring of rage and this feeling of something's got to change, like we can't go on as it is. And I think the Tories uh, failed to understand this, failed to understand that uh, mood of frustration and anger that is below the surface. And, uh, <clears throat> and hence they tried to frame the election all about this, uh, this issue. Actually, there was a poll, uh, I'm not sure when exactly, it was during this election, and it asked people what was their most important reason for voting. And uh, the number one reason was healthcare. There was 23% of uh, people said that that was uh, the main issue. And that's obviously understandable. The NHS is in, uh, is in an absolute uh, crisis. Even the, uh, the British Red Cross said earlier this year that the NHS is facing a humanitarian crisis. And then you have uh, you know, babies being like, forced to wait for hours on sort of makeshift cots made out of chairs. You have people literally dying because they're not seen in time, uh, because they're just uh, being like, forced to wait in beds because the, the hospitals aren't uh, staffed properly. Uh, number two was the economy. 20% of people said that that was the main reason. And you can understand this. You know, you've had decades of deindustrialization. You've had you know, falling wages over, over years and years now. You've got massive inequality. And, uh, and all the, the jobs that are created over the last uh, uh, period since the crisis, I think between 2008 and uh, 2015, <coughs> only one in 40 jobs was uh, like a full-time secure contract. Nearly everything else is kind of zero hours or uh, part-time work or insecure jobs. 
very low pay, minimum wage, and so on. Uh, so that's that's clearly a major issue. The, uh, <clears throat> the it was only uh, number three, four, and five. Uh, were immigration, terrorism, and, e and the EU, both from 15, 14%, and, and 14% as well. So my point is, it wasn't just this, uh, this Brexit election as the Tories uh, had hoped. But I think also the Blairites also failed to understand this mood that existed uh, below the surface, just as they did back in 2015, when they actually allowed Corbyn to, to go on the ballot paper when he had the leadership election. They, uh, they completely didn't understand that uh, there's been a profound shift under the surface. They thought they would let him on just to kind of give a bit more legitimacy to that contest. They thought he was no hope. Uh, but actually, he completely smashed it. He won a landslide, not just in 2015, but again last year when they, uh, they tried to remove him again. And now uh, you can see the same kind of mistake when the right wing leaked the Labour manifesto uh, a week earlier. And what they were hoping to do is that they, they thought this manifesto, I think they genuinely thought that these ideas in it, you know, just crazy loony left things. They thought, oh, this is some kind of uh, Trotskyist uh, kind of fantasy. They thought this is going to be extremely unpopular. It's going to completely bomb. There's going to be outrage against it. And all the press are going to hammer it. People are going to be up in arms. And then it's going to catch out, you know, Corbyn, uh, put him on the back foot, force him to compromise, force him to water it down and make him look really, uh, really weak and, uh, and unstable. Well, obviously, the opposite was if the uh, uh, occurred. The, the manifesto was extremely popular. Poll after poll showed that all the policies in it uh, were massively connected. And uh, rather than having to backtrack, it was the Blairites had to then push on the back foot. And it's because he had to, you know, all sorts of massively popular policies. Things like renationalizing uh, the railways and utilities. It's like, overwhelmingly popular, even the Montreal voters. You've had uh, things like a minimum wage of £10. Of course, that's uh, popular. I said real wages in the UK have, uh, have actually fallen uh, by 10.5% between 2008 to 2015. That's, uh, that's been the biggest uh, drop in the OECD group of rich countries. It's second in Europe, only to Greece. Uh, you've had a public sector wage freeze. You've got a fifth of uh, the population living in poverty. So this is a, a massive uh, thing that will transform people's lives. You've got things like a massive house building uh, program. I think they want to build a million houses, half of them would be council houses. This, this massively uh, connects with people. It's, as I said, a chronic housing crisis, particularly in places like London. Uh, you know, they're also talking about abolishing uh, tuition fees. And not just something that would happen in years uh, to, to come, but by this September, so that the, the next intake of students will not be paying it. And what's more, the current students, so that presumably that's you and here, who've been paying £9,000 a year fees, would get that reimbursed. And uh, that, can, that clearly connects. And uh, it's, you can see that these kind of things have tapped into kind of fundamentally class questions. And yet, so it's particularly as well energised young people. You know, for decades we've been told that young people are apathetic, not interested in politics. Well, I say it's the other way around. It's that politicians haven't been interested in the youth. And actually that we've had no reason really to be interested in politics when all you've had is sort of various shades of Tory austerity to vote for. Well, now we've seen, we've seen the, you know, the, the, the real interest of the youth in politics, and it's massive. I think 1.5 million uh, young people or so registered to vote uh, in the, uh, the, the few-week uh, window. And uh, the bulk of those will be to support uh, Jeremy Corbyn and his programme. I think there's various opinion polls, but the, uh, the, kind of the, the figure that, um, that comes up again and again is of uh, 18 to 24-year-old uh, voters it's around 70% or so say they back uh, Labour, or even higher, and only about 15 to 20% say they would back uh, the Tories. And that's uh, obviously been transformed into a massive increase in the turnout, particularly young people. And uh, I think that kind of uh, thing was not picked up by the opinion polls. They tried to correct the mistake they made in 2015 where they overestimated the youth. So this time they sort of just mechanically said, oh, okay, well, even though there's this, uh, this big youth showing, they're not going to show up, so you know, they, they, we won't count on them. And uh, obviously it's taken them by surprise. Even just, uh, just yesterday there was an opinion poll putting the Tories on an 11-point uh, uh, lead. And, uh, <clears throat> but it was not just um, Labour holding onto their marginals, they actually took a swathe of uh, very safe Tory seats. And uh, for example, Canterbury and Whitstable in Kent, the Tories had an 18% majority before, they had a majority of over 10,000 votes. In fact, there's never been a Labour-held uh, seat in the entire history of that seat, and it came back uh, as long as it's been there. 8,000 people registered, I think, uh, in that uh, period. 
vast bulk of those would have been young people. And you've, uh, as such, seen a massive swing towards Labour, who, uh, who you've, uh, for the first time, ever taken it. Others, as, uh, as some of you here might have uh, uh, fallen into this category, Warwick and Leamington Spa. The Tories had a 13% uh, majority before, now that's been smashed. Uh, Battersea in London, they had a 13.5% majority, they've lost that. Uh, Portsmouth South, I think, has been taken again by Labour for the first time ever, where the Tories had a 12% majority. Uh, Brighton and Kempton, there was a 19% swing. Uh, Sheffield Hallam, as I'm sure anyone who's watching the, uh, the results <laughs> coming last night, have been a highlight, seeing the look on Nick Clegg's face as he realised he'd lost it. Uh, and even Kensington and Chelsea in London, one of the richest areas uh, in the country, uh, lost their Tory majority and has gone over to Labour. And this is all despite the most vicious press campaign directed against Corbyn that I think you've ever seen in uh, British politics. You know, they tried to present him as weak, as chaotic, as a terrorist sympathiser uh, who presided over a coalition of chaos. These things sound ironic now, given that the Tories are precisely how to preside over a coalition of chaos with uh, a group of people who are terrorist sympathisers. <laughs> but um, you know, people are obviously not stupid. You know, people can see the press is owned by a handful of uh, rich billionaires and uh, can obviously see that the press has closed ranks against him and has come out viciously against him. And I uh, can see the Tories getting an easy ride when they're interviewed and, and interviewed over the TV. Uh, whereas it, all Labour politicians um, get the kitchen sink thrown at them. Look at how Diane Abbott, Diane Abbott has been treated in the press. It's absolutely outrageous. And uh, people understand this. And therefore, the, the, the media does not play the role that it might once have been able to play. You know, when, it, when its portrayal of uh, events doesn't match up with people's real experience of life, then people say to hell with it, and, uh, and we're not going to believe that anymore. And you can see that Corbyn's campaign was actually massively able to bypass the, the traditional press anyway. You know, they had mass mobilisations of people. Hundreds of thousands of people chipped in money to fund the campaign. You know, tens of thousands of people all across <coughs> the country hitting the streets to leaflet, to knock on doors, to talk to people. Uh, you had Corbyn organising mass rallies all across the country. I think he spoke at 90 or so in seven weeks. And uh, these rallies, people could see for themselves like, the enthusiasm and the support for his ideas. And, and get a sense of their own strength, and therefore be energised to actually take that enthusiasm and then, and then go and impart it to other people who might not have been at those rallies. And, and, uh, and you can see finally people thought that, that finally now we have a programme that's worth fighting for, and actually will make huge sacrifices of their time and effort to do so. The Tories' campaign, in contrast, was complete shambles, it was, it was completely dismal. And I think this is not accidental, I think it's really a reflection of at root that here you have a party representing the interests of the ruling class. They're tasked with carry out, carrying out the programme of that ruling class, which, in a period of worldwide crisis, means trying to restore profitability. And that means attacking the working class, you know, cutting jobs, cutting wages, cutting pensions, and, uh, <coughs> and uh, you know, wholesale uh, assault. So you know, what can they actually say, what positive things can they put in their manifesto? They can't really. Hence, it's full of just kind of empty platitudes again, around things like Brexit, saying, oh, we're going to take back control, and things like this. But no, no real concrete, uh, you know, things to really get excited about. And, uh, you know, what can they really say about social issues? What are they going to say? Yeah, we're going to continue to cut healthcare. We're going to continue to cut education. Uh, you know, they've got nothing positive to offer. But that didn't stop them, however, from uh, putting in the, uh, the so-called dementia tax. Now, I think clearly they, they were so confident of winning this election by a landslide, they thought, OK, we can throw in a few of the, uh, the awful things that we're going to be forced to carry out. And if we put them in the manifesto, then obviously that's it. People, you know, we'll say we've got legitimacy for this. Uh, the House of Lords aren't going to uh, question it. It will uh, sail through. But obviously, I think they got kind of drunk on their, their own confidence. It was a complete disaster. It led very rapidly to a U-turn, which uh, they even refused to acknowledge was a U-turn. And uh, <coughs> it showed up uh, Theresa May, apart from being you know, stable and strong, as being uh, weak and wobbly, and, and, and more than that, as a, as a liar, as someone who's actually not afraid, or not prepared to actually tell the truth. And uh, you can see, whenever Theresa May spoke on TV, uh, whenever she actually went out to the street and had to engage with uh, ordinary people, she came across like a complete robot, you know, just repeating stock phrases, never actually being able to respond to things that people uh, um, threw at her. And it's, ex it's exactly that kind of politician that makes people hate politicians. And uh, <clears throat> it's led to this massive backlash against her, and even the media began to turn against her, because uh, she was seen as so hopeless that they thought, well, 
I think they, they thought, well, we've got, to, we've got to be seen as at least, you know, uh, holding her up. And maybe if we're seen as attacking the Tories a bit, then maybe our, the mud we throw against Corbyn might seem a bit more, uh, more legitimate. But uh, <clears throat> I would say that uh, you would not have had the same effects uh, in the Labour Party, despite this, uh, this chaos within the Tories, if it was led by a Blairite. I think we've got to be clear that, you know, if they had someone they call uh, so-called moderate, someone they think is, you know, sensible, uh, that kind of candidate, you would have effectively just had one more robot versus another robot. And uh, I don't think it would have had this huge impact of enthusing millions of people. The, the Corbyn effect is obviously massive. You've had uh, someone who, who, for once, actually seemed like he was actually, uh, you know, telling the truth. He came across as someone who had charisma, he actually seemed like he was honest, and actually really believed in his own programme. And uh, he, he came across, you see, you see him speaking, that he really did uh, want Britain for the many and not for the few. Unlike all these other politicians in their slick suits who say one thing and mean another. And uh, the idea that Blairite would have had the same effect is, is I think, honestly just laughable. And, and people know that. You can see this in the, the London swings and the vote. So look, for example, at uh, someone like Wes Streeting, like an awful right winger, this Blairite guy, he had a majority of 300 that he won at the last election, which shows like the, the massive uh, like lack of enthusiasm for his uh, his personality, his uh, program, and so on, uh, and also for the for the whole kind of Miliband austerity light kind of approach. But uh, this time he got a majority of over 10,000. Now that wasn't that suddenly the people in that uh, constituency have all suddenly grown to love West Streeting and think, oh, here now we have someone moderate and you know, sensible. It's not. It's because they're voting to back Corbyn because they're refused by his program. And uh, you've seen a similar situation uh, in many constituencies all over the country. Now anyway, that's uh, kind of, I think, a summary of like, what's happened the last few weeks. But really the question is, what now? Where do we go from here? Now I think it's likely that we'll have, I think, a Tory minority government uh, propped up by uh, the DUP in Ireland. But such a government would be incredibly unstable. And uh, I think it would, it would be, as I say, a genuine coalition of chaos. You know, it would be a crisis government from day one. And the, uh, we've got the Brexit negotiations in just 10 days' time. Uh, there's no time, I think, really for a Tory leadership contest in this period. I'm not saying it, it might be possible for them to just sort of uh, have a kind of backroom deal and uh, just put, put someone else in if, uh, <clears throat> if they can find the right candidate. But uh, they, they've got a huge amount on their plate. They've got to try and come to some kind of arrangement with the DUP over Brexit and over their programme. Uh, and the TUP have a very different idea, I think, of Brexit than the Tories do. There's, uh, there's also, uh, they're extremely uh, reactionary on many kind of social issues, you know, things like abortion, gay rights and so forth. Uh, the, 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 these two parties are going to clash. But uh, <clears throat> they're also not going to have this strong government for, with which to carry out austerity against the working class. Uh, you know, they've they barely got a, ma a majority of, uh, of less than a handful. And the, and the DP, before, from Ireland, they could blame the Tories for all the austerity that was coming their way. And they say, well, this isn't our fault. We're forced to implement it, but really, you should blame the Tories. Now they're not going to have that excuse. Now people are going to say, well, you're responsible for allowing this, these austerity uh, policies through. So they're going to have uh, a hell of a hard time actually uh, forming any kind of uh, stable government. Also, the issue of Brexit, as I mentioned earlier, I think it goes really to the heart of why uh, May called this election. It's really, to, to put it simply, there's a massive kind of split within the Tory party over the question of Brexit and over the question of Europe. And this is far from being resolved by this election, it's been uh, worsened. Because to put it simply, you've got a section of the British ruling class, the kind of main dominant section of the ruling class, like the kind of big business, big capitalist uh, uh, layer, who really don't, do not want Brexit. They didn't want it in the first place. They certainly do not want to lose access to their main market, which is almost 50% of the, their market goes to Europe. They do not want to see massive tariffs being put on their exports. So uh, they want to re retain access to the single market. Now there's a, an another layer, more kind of frenzied middle class layer, the smaller businessmen types, who you know, are crushed by like, globalisation, crushed by the EU, and, w and want to get out at, um, at any cost. And for, for these people, these kind of rabid Brexiteers, any kind of compromise with the EU will be seen as a complete red line and a, and a complete capitulation that they want nothing to do with. So, for example, things on uh, uh, the question of a divorce payment or of uh, any kind of jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, they will say, no, we're not going to accept anything on this. And if the government has, <laughs> doesn't even have any kind of majority, 
that these people now have a lot of power within the Tory party and can try and put a spanner in the works. So it's now much more likely that you could see a train crash Brexit um, within that party. Uh, so that, that problem hasn't been solved, it's got much more worse. You're going to see a very unstable uh, Tory government, which at some point could split uh, and, uh, and crack apart. There's also the uh, deteriorating economic uh, situation, uh, which really is not just a, a factor in Britain, but is, is a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, even in Britain, over the last few months, consumer spending has been falling, uh, GDP growth is, uh, is slowing down, inflation is rising. All the signs are, 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 are worsening. And the ruling class know this. This is why they wanted a stronger government to be able to actually be able to implement the, the required austerity uh, in order to restore profitability. Uh, but also, we're, I would say we're actually overdue another deep world slump. Uh, and there's many flashpoints around the world. The, the world economy is extremely uh, fragile at the moment. Look at places like Italy, look at places like China. All the symptoms are there uh, building up to, to a massive financial crisis that will engulf the whole world. Actually, the Royal Bank of Scotland last year said that 2016 would be a cataclysmic year for the world economy. Now that prediction has, has yet to, to bear out, but it's just a matter of time. It's a question of uh, when, not if. Hence the need for the, the Tories to rapidly uh, cut the deficit. That's why since 2010, <coughs> they've been so adamant at, at, at uh, getting, getting rid of the deficit, because they know another crisis is inevitable under capitalism. And they need to be able to, uh, to, to be in a position uh, where they're not going to be completely destroyed by it. So they want a bit of fat in order to, to when they have to bail out the banks and companies again. Uh, they don't want to be in a situation where they've already cut massively to the bone, and then they've got to uh, cut even further, producing even more social instability. So um, that is on the cards. And I think it's therefore very unlikely that this government is going to see out its turn. And I think we could even see a uh, collapse uh, within a year, or even shorter than that. Therefore, I think the Corbyn movement needs to be prepared for this. You know, we, we need to actually, like, write, like face facts and actually prepare ourselves now for this instability and actually get organised. And uh, <clears throat> not just prepare for, for these events happening years down the line, like 2022 or whatever. This is, this is now, this struggle is happening today and, and for, from now on. And uh, I think the, the Labour Party are correctly putting forward uh, this idea of presenting an alternative budget, saying that, you know, this is our programme, this is a bold programme which has enormous support within society, and that, uh, <clears throat> we're going to present this to Parliament if other parties choose not to, to back this programme, they will have to explain to their electors why they don't want to, to um, support this. And uh, put the other parties on the back foot. You know, they shouldn't be offering compromise and backroom deals with parties like the Lib Dems and, and so on, who, who want to water down this programme, who want to kind of bring it to, uh, to a programme that's respectable and manageable for the interests of the ruling class. We can't have that. And I think, uh, I would say, we, we can't say for sure, but I, I would, uh, in my opinion, I think it's probably unlikely uh, that uh, there will be a minority Labour government, at least initially. I think the ruling class would much prefer a minority uh, Tory government, uh, despite its uh, instability, despite its, uh, its uh, chaos, rather than unleash the Corbyn movement uh, into, into power. Because uh, that, for them, is a, is a much more uncertain thing, and, uh, and is, is much more uh, worrying for them. In any case, I would say that the Corbyn movement, or Corbyn, they need to come up fighting from day one. They need to, uh, we need to be massively mobilising our forces. We need to be taking the struggle to uh, now beyond Parliament, to the streets, to the workplaces, and say that you know, this government has no mandate, has no majority, and it does not represent us. And uh, any attempt to, by this government to attack workers, uh, to make, make us pay for the crisis of the rich, will be met with fierce resistance. Uh, in the form of demonstrations on the streets, occupations of uh, workplaces, strikes and so on. And I, I really I think the TUC should come out now and be mobilising for a one-day general strike, you know, as a, as a show of strength against this, uh, this unstable Tory government, and actually boost the Corbyn movement, saying, you know, you know, we are backing this Labour, Labour uh, Party, and we have, we have the, the support of millions of people across the country, and, they, you know, and actually embolden the, the movement of uh, the working class, allow us to feel our own strength, show who has the real power in society, and actually say, you know, this is just the beginning. Any attempt by this government to attack us, we will, we will meet it with mass resistance, and if necessary, we will bring it down and bring a Corbyn government to power. That's the kind of fighting talk that needs the, the leadership of the Labour movement needs to, to be putting forward. And I'll say, uh, as well, the Labour Party needs to, to begin to organise its hundreds of thousands of members, 
Uh, I think over 100,000 have joined in the last seven weeks alone, precisely on the strength of uh, this manifesto, precisely because they're infused to fight for, for to change, completely change society. And uh, although the Blairites have come quiet in the, the last few hours, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what can they say uh, today about Corbyn? All their thing about him being unelectable has is, uh, is clearly been shown to be false. Uh, but I don't think they're going to be quiet for long. I think they're biding their time, but they're going to be preparing their forces to go back on the attack. And I think they're going to continue to try and undermine him in every way possible that they can. And they're going to try and sabotage the left. And uh, I think we've got to be clear that uh, Cor Corbyn has to, uh, to um, you know, when Corbyn wins the next election, which I think is a matter of time, uh, this, this, as I said, this Tory government is very unstable. It's going to produce a further polarisation of society to the left and the right. And uh, <clears throat> I think there's, there's no way his programme is going to be able, possible to be carried out if you have uh, control of the Parliamentary Labour Party, the MPs, if, if, uh, if that's still in the hands of this, uh, this Blairite uh, league. They're going to force him to try and backtrack, to try and compromise, to try and soften down his, uh, his ideas. I say, we cannot accept this. We cannot let this, this tiny cabal of MPs override the, the interests and, and the, the determination, the will, of hundreds of thousands of the members and actually millions of people in society who want to fight and see this programme implemented. How dare these, these, these tiny handful of people try and, uh, and try and do that against us? The, the left needs to, to organise for a mandatory reselection of MPs as a basic democratic right. Um, <clears throat> but, but it's not as... Um, it's, it's also not unthinkable that a layer of these MPs are going to break ranks anyway. And I think that is uh, ultimately a, a question of time. They're going to try and uh, judge the right moment for us to do it. But um, you, know, you can see things like voting on as aspects of Brexit or things of foreign intervention like they did with Syria. They'll say, oh, we're voting in the national interest, which as we all know is really the interest of the banks of big business. That's how they try and play it. And I think that really would be a de facto split. And uh, Corbyn, I think, has to come out uh, firmly against that. He can no longer put forward this, uh, this line of, oh, we're all just a broad church and you know, we just all want to get along and have unity and love for one another. He's got to say no. He's got to say, if these people are not prepared to fight for this programme, which is enormously popular, and stand up for the interests of the working class, if they want to, to break with this, if they want to actually join the rich in, uh, in voting for Tory policies uh, and, and, and you know, backing up the establishment, then they should clear off and join the Tories or the Liberals and, the, and go and hang out with their millionaire friends there. We need real MPs who are going to put, implement this, uh, this programme, which is popular. And I think that would get an enormous echo. That would be enormously uh, uh, popular. People, people are joining the Labour Party, not because they want it to be some kind of uh, you know, Blairite uh, thing, but because they want a fighting party that's going to transform society. Um, but but they need, the, the left needs to be supported inside the party. It's, it's one thing to have 600,000 members, and I think that will likely increase uh, massively over the next few weeks. Um, and I think everyone here should join the party. But I say it's not enough just to simply join the party and you know, pay your, pay your uh, dues. You need to actually go along to meetings, you need to get organised, and you need to actually take this fight to the Blairites, fight for socialist programme, and, uh, <clears throat> and not just let others... Uh, hope others are going to do this for you. You can't. You can, the, the situation that we're in now on a world scale doesn't allow for passivity. It doesn't allow for us to sit back and just hope things will be all right. We need to take control of our lives. And I said that's where the importance of Marxism comes in, because you know we have to prepare ourselves for this uh, for this massive crisis and this period of huge instability that we found ourselves in. You know, the ruling class have no answer to this worldwide crisis of capitalism. Uh, the only answer they have is further attacks, further austerity. Uh, I think we've got to see Corbyn's programme as a huge step forward against that. Uh, you know, it's completely transformed the situation. It's firmly put left-wing ideas back into the mainstream. Uh, I think the genie's out in the bottle in that respect. There's no going back to now from this. Uh, and he's infused millions of people to actually uh, you know, you know, get out there and actually fight for these kind of ideas. He's, in, he's involved in a, a genuine mass movement. That's, that's really what it is. And that's precisely what the ruling class fear the most. But I think as, uh, as much as we want to see this programme implemented, uh, you know, contains many progressive uh, reforms which would, uh, which would transform our lives. We've got to learn from the, as Marxists, from the entire history of the class struggle, and that, and that recognise that no ruling class has ever just given up its power and privileges without, uh, without a massive fight. And they'll do everything they can to resist this and to try and cling on to power. They're not just going to say, oh yeah, you want to increase taxes on us, fine, yeah, go and have all that money. They're going to fight it to you for now. And they're going to come down like a ton of bricks on Corbyn, 
uh, should he uh, win the government? And I think if, uh, if you think the media is bad against him now, they're going to go into overdrive against him uh, should he win. Uh, when, he, when he became leader of the party in 2015, you even had sections like leading members of the, uh, the British army saying that, that they would be prepared to launch a coup against him should he ever actually become prime minister. This is the kind of level that the ruling class are at least in words talking about. Whether they'd actually go that far is another thing. I think they would think very hard before actually going down that route because it would effectively uh, pose the risk of civil war. But uh, <clears throat> the, the point is that as well, the ruling class, they would unleash a strike of capital. They would try and uh, unleash all kind of economic sabotage in order to bring down a Corbyn government and frustrate that kind of program. And remember, they, these people only invest for profit. They don't care about anything else. And if they can get a better return anywhere else in the world, they'll take their money elsewhere. Also, the question of how to pro pay for this uh, program is vital. You know, uh, of course we agree that the rich should be paying more taxes, but that is one, is one thing to, to put that in the program, it's another thing to actually make them cough up. And uh, <clears throat> they will simply move their money abroad, or they, they pay an army of accountants and uh, expensive lawyers to hide their money in off offshore schemes and stuff. The Panama Papers uh, exposed this. Uh, and we saw this very concretely in 2012 in France, where the so-called Socialist Party said, we're going to end austerity, we're going to transform France, we're going to make the rich pay for increased taxes. And very rapidly, they did a complete U-turn on their programme, because the rich said, you want us to pay? So, yeah, just you try it. We're, we're not going to do it. We're going to move our money elsewhere. And the government, rather than actually coming out hard against them, actually backtracked and, uh, and actually implemented the most vicious austerity that they've seen yet in France. I would say that... <clears throat> Where does that leave us then? Does that just mean we say, okay, well, fine, uh, you, you, like, keep things as they are? Of course not. Uh, that doesn't mean we give up. We say, look, the money is there. There's an, an, like, we're in one of the richest countries of the world. Uh, the richest 10% of the population are in 45% of the world. And actually, the richest 1% of people in Britain have 25%, a quarter, of all the wealth in the society. Uh, <laughs> they need to be expropriated. Look at the big businesses. In Britain alone, they're sitting on a cash pile of an estimated £750 billion, pounds, which they're not investing in, in uh, production because of this worldwide crisis. It's not profitable for them to do so. So they just simply just speculate on the property market and the stock exchange instead. Look at banks. They control trillions of pounds uh, <clears throat> under their control. At the same time, we're told that there's no money for schools, no money for hospitals, no money for decent pay pensions or wages and so on. And uh, millions of people are forced around food banks. Now look, the, clearly the money's there. We need to fight for a Labour Party that's prepared to actually adopt a much uh, bolder programme and say that we're going to nationalise, we're going to take over these big businesses, these banks, we're going to expropriate this 1% of people and, uh, and, and put these uh, businesses, these industries under democratic workers' control and actually begin to plan production for people's needs and not the interests of this tiny 1% of, uh, of parasites. And I think if you did this, it would be incredibly popular. I say if... Uh, <coughs> If, you, if you've been to any of Corbyn's rallies over the last few weeks, you can see that actually the biggest cheers he gets is when he comes out boldly, when he comes out and speaks in, in class terms against the rich. You know, when he's uh, talking about overthrowing the rig system, when he's talking about fighting for a program for the benefit of ordinary working people against this uh, handful of super rich, this, these kind of things are extremely popular. I think we have to get organised now. We have to take on this challenge. I say anyone who's in this room now who hasn't joined the IMT, you should do so. Come and speak to us after this about this. Because it's not, it's not enough to simply join the Labour Party as an individual and try and fight for the ideas. We need to be organised collectively around these, uh, this kind of programme. We're much stronger collectively than we are uh, just by ourselves. But it's, this fight is not just limited to Britain. It's a worldwide struggle. You know, capitalism is international. The crisis is international. Socialism has to be international. And that's why we organise it internationally in over 30 countries around the world. Uh, but I say, if, if Corbyn formed such a programme, uh, it, would be, it would electrify the situation internationally as well. And it's, uh, it's no coincidence that already leaders in Podemos, the uh, left-wing uh, party in Spain, have already come out in support of Corbyn and uh, c congratulated them on their campaign. And I think uh, th this clearly would be a beacon to, to workers all over the world. And uh, <clears throat> we'll be fighting for, for not just a socialist Britain, but a socialist United States of Europe as part of, of a world socialist federation. Just to sum up then, I say, I think we live in incredibly exciting times. I think uh, the, the crisis of capitalism is generating enormous instability at every level. And what this election really shows is that the ruling class is no longer able to rule in the old way that they did before. They're no longer able just to kind of have business as usual. Their, their, their kind of grip on things is, uh, is falling uh, between their fingers.
And I think you can see as well the embryo of a new society, a social society struggling to be born. And uh, this is a society you know, based on people's needs and not the profit of a tiny uh, handful of, uh, of billionaires. You know, we need to face up to the tasks ahead of us. We know it's not easy. We know it involves enormous sacrifice of time and en energy and, and money and so on. But I say that there's, uh, these are sacrifices worth making if we're actually to have a world fit for humanity to live in. So I say join us in that struggle and uh, yeah, let's fight for socialism. Thank you very much, James. So, uh, yeah, we now go to the discussion. If um, yeah, anyone has questions, points, uh, things they want to raise, um, yeah, please do. And we uh, discuss that amongst each other and come to conclusion level. Uh, thank you very much. Any initial points? I think um, <clears throat> when you talk about like, the steps, the kind of the bolder steps that you wanted to see, including nationalization, worker control, I was wondering if there like if there wasn't a bit of a tension there between state nationalization and worker control. So on the one hand you have this centralization, um, more slightly authoritarian Marxism and then this kind of libertarian one where the workers got it. So I mean is there a bit of a tension there between those two objectives? Anyone want to respond? I suppose the point is that you're not trying to sort of align those interests, but the interests of the state are the interests of the worker. So if if you actually fully government, the difference shouldn't be important. If the workers are controlling the sort of business, that should be the same as the state uh, controlling the business of the state. I can kind of add to that point. So I guess you're kind of right in the sense of you can't just sort of automatically define the state as is as necessarily being work control. And there's a lot in Marx's literature, both Lenin, but also Marx and Engels, they talk about a need to smash the state machinery. The state machinery is in itself a neutral thing that needs to be changed in that sense to sort of more proletarian forms of state control. So more democratic participation at all levels of the state, for example. People probably see a significant change from parliamentary systems and things like that. Something I would ask is if we're talking democracy but also internationalism, um, what do we do with Brexit? <laughs> How do you mean? <laughs> oh, the democratic voice of the people did, at least with 52%, say we want to leave the EU. But that, <clears throat> and that, that's, that's sort of the democracy side, but there was talk of sort of the United States of Europe, that's the, in the identically opposite direction. How do you reconcile the two? Um, Does anyone else got anything else to say, Thomas? Uh, yeah, I think uh, actually this is what uh, probably means the music. I It was a historical opportunity to understand what uh, the vote is, what the uh, the British will want, and actually the mechanism <coughs> was clear. And uh, actually, you know, all the <coughs> all, all the campaign from uh, <coughs> from the right wing uh, people that uh, um, uh, that all these people that, that voted for Brexit are racist and right wing. Uh, you know, now it's clear that it's not true because UK was uh, totally uh, destroyed. Uh, so I think this was something that uh, Corbyn interesting me. If if uh, he was uh, in favour of Brexit, I think uh, he would he would be definitely the leader of the Labour. Um, uh, on 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 the point, um, you said how we could be you know international at the same time in favour of uh, Brexit. Or, yeah, actually, wh when you vote uh, when you vote for Brexit, it doesn't mean that you vote against uh, you know the European. Uh, federation or you know uh, a Europe of um, you know, the the workers, uh, you uh, you vote against the European Union as a as a you know, coalition of uh, uh, the big firms and the big uh, interests of uh, you know the the, the bourgeois and you know the uh, the capitalists. 
this is uh, you know in the nature of uh, the European Union uh, from the beginning is, the, is uh, like that. Uh, so uh, when you when you say no to the European Union, you don't say no to a new uh, you know union. Yeah, yeah just kind of coming on uh, back on that point. Actually, I think it's really uh, you know quite um, it's central. To emphasize the point that you know when we're for internationalism, we're not for internationalism in the sense of those nations getting on. We're for internationalism on the basis of the working class. European Union, uh, and we actually did talk about this uh, at the end of last term. Uh, you know, it's a creation of uh, a huge array of different you know capitalist organisations. It was originally created as a cartel to uh, for different uh, European capitalists, French and German capitalists, to exploit uh, workers from across um, you know across Europe. Why don't they bore a free movement of people? It isn't they like people being able to you know, move freely and have nice lives. They like to be able to exploit and push down wages and all of that. Um, in fact, actually, it's a really interesting, you know, if you get a chance to read the history of it, uh, it basically just comes about through French and German capitalists, one trying to dominate the other. There was nothing internationalist about it in uh, really any sense, in any progressive sense whatsoever. It doesn't mean, again, we're initially for a Brexit position. Uh, but we're for, you know, effectively a working class position, a position where the working class is benefit on an international scale. I think actually when you look at it, many people, uh, when they despise the European Union, come from that position. They come from it on the basis that, uh, you know, it is completely undemocratic. It, uh, you know, completely alienates people. It's a clique of technocrats um, doing whatever they can to try and, you know, avoid ordinary working class people having any control or say whatsoever. Uh, that's what they really despise about it. They despise the fact that, you know, they feel completely powerless in their own minds. And I'd say then, for if you, if you are internationalist, um, it can, is completely reconcilable. In fact, it, I'd say perhaps there's more tension with being for the European Union uh, and being internationalist, especially when you see the situation of what they do to Greek, Spanish, French workers, so on and so on. Um, and kind of just coming on that point in the state of internationalization, I think it's really, really interesting question. Um, on the sense that you have this situation, let's say, uh, well, you know, is nationalisation, you know, really something, in, how, how does that really work, you know, all about democratic control, and I think Engels in Socialism, Utopian Scientific, uh, at the end of it, makes a really interesting point, he says, well, if you just nationalise industry, but you do it on a capitalist basis, well, there's no gain for the workers whatsoever, you're simply being exploited on the work, or, you know, increasing levels of working class. So we don't argue that, we argue for nationalisation as a means to democratize, uh, to democratize the workplace as a means to actually put working people in control of it. Working people, you take control of the state. Again, the point uh, emphasized by Lenin and the State of Revolution, working people take control of the state to then take control of the capitalist industries. They, uh, the state, uh, you know, capitalism falls underneath the state, the workers take control of capitalism in that sense. And on this sense of there being a, you know, a, antagonistic between, let's say, democratic democracy and hierarchy, etc. I think that's only the case when that hierarchy comes on a uh, society which is innately divided against each other. When you see hierarchy on the basis of uh, you know, class divisions, when the basis of one group of people trying to exploit the other, that is what creates a hierarchy which is necessarily you know, terrible. Uh, but when you see, let's say, you know, simply people being in charge because it's easiest, because that is uh, you know, what people democratically try to do with their delegates, uh, when they are ultimately accountable to on a democratic basis, on a true democratic basis, and on a working control, then I think again they are incredibly complementary. So it's like a bridge, like the nationalizing is like a bridge between the kind of capitalism and this network of control and order. Like it's the way it kind of gets to it. It's the means, like you said. Well, again, that's uh, that's a important uh, reason to be in favour of nationalisation, um, and also to you can have that control and you can rationalise the economy. Uh, you, in capitalism, production is anarchic. In socialism, we can actually plan and organize and uh, socialize production in this sense. But again, then the reason we often feel, let's say, perhaps, or many people, you know, on the libertarian side are opposed to the state is because the state's an oppressive organ. But in socialism, it's only an oppressive organ because it comes from these class contradictions. Uh, in socialism, when it's in the hands of the working class, it lacks that same sense of, uh, it is completely uh, a new organ entirely. Is something actually truly democratic and then you know, uh, doesn't have an oppressive element at all. Um, and yeah, again, of course, this has to be built proactively by this movement. This isn't something that will passively happen. And again, building those movements themselves, it should be seeking to incorporate.
already enfranchised the workers in the union. So it should already build itself on the basis of mass participation. Thus, when assuming state power, there was already a desire and a will to change state machinery in order to meet this new form of mass participation. But yes, it would be an active process, I guess. It's not only passive, we'd have to like, think about, okay, how can we arrange the way we vote for things, for example, mm -hmm. such that it better suits uh, mass participation? How can we organise ourselves? So we have any ideas on what might happen next? Is the Tory happy with you? Has there been any news like this afternoon? Because I've been like stuck in a train. I don't know what's happened in the last few hours, but obviously, we could just say a week is a, yeah. a long time in politics, so today is like, even more so than that. Can you talk about the really safe seats, conservative seats that have been lost? I don't know if you guys have seen the Kensington. Um, like, it, it, it's at like 30. So it's a third recount now, but. In its first one, it's 50 votes in favour of Labour. The second one was like 38. And it's a final recount tonight, but like, it's just insane. Like, you know, I never thought Kensington would flip. So has it still not been announced? Yet? It hasn't been announced, but like, I assume like, if, if he both times they count yeah. it's Labour, yeah, and the brewers are Labour. It's um, been the very bad that they've had a 20 minute split. Yeah, <laughs> it's insane. 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 It's I think it reflects in many respects, um, you know, there's this kind of idea, uh, which is kind of a simplification of, uh, you know, having an economic base and a political superstructure type way to think about, well, how, uh, you know, material conditions and stuff work in Marxism. And you see that, you know, that we have this crisis in 2008, uh, we have a huge economic crisis, etc., and how this slowly begins to unravel into a political one. First, you have the coalition government. Then you have, you know, the strikes, etc. Then throughout 2015, 2016, you get Brexit. And now suddenly you're in a position where the capitalist class is going into the biggest negotiations you could ever imagine with effectively no, no secure government on a, uh, you know, on a minority government, a political nightmare uh, scenario for the capitalist class. Because ultimately the capitalist system and the instability it creates continue to... Um, Undermine the very political stability of capitalism. It's interesting because there is, like, it felt like there was a massive calm before the storm in a way, like after the financial crisis, in both the US, Britain, and Europe. Um, for almost a couple of years, it, things politically actually remained quite normal in a lot of ways, like mm. conventional. Yeah, um, um, yeah, exactly. Even slightly more, yeah, establishment in some ways, but um, it, it's taken a while for us to really see the effects of it. Mm. It did feel kind of weirdly normal with Obama and Conservative Coalition. It felt kind of like even the past 30 years, really. Mm. But now it's seen, definitely feels more true. Yeah, and certainly. I think one of the key elements of that is that you know, there being a boom that you saw from after the 1990s based on huge expansion of credit and huge expansion of markets, the introduction of China. All of that created this, uh, well, you know, termed a huge amount of fat in the capitalist system, and we were able to have uh, you know, very inflated uh, you know, public services, they would have like relatively strong welfare state and stuff like this. And also, and really kind of a key element, they were just completely crushed, um, you know, all the workers' movements, I mean, the trade unions and the Labour Party and all of this were completely hollowed out. But, you know, I mean, again, a couple of years ago, if you're talking, maybe the Greens are for some serious left-wing party, I mean, people wouldn't see that as perhaps something completely mad to say, but it shows a complete hollowing out of um, you know the British working class and of the uh, political entity. It's taken a while for that to come back for you know, effectively all this fact to be continually cut and cut and cut. But it starts to hurt to the point where you actually create this political um, political crisis to unravel. And again, I think there's something that the same things which have caught, which have caused that fact to be raised are. Still there, and it's still going to continue to drive the situation on. I mean, a question I'd ask <coughs> is if you do see it, you talked about, um, does that not make a movement towards the left in, in practical terms? I mean, I mean if Jeremy Corbyn comes on the wrong side of 30, yeah, we wouldn't have a capitalist movement being this massive. Yeah, yeah. Can 
considering the, at least for the foreseeable imminent future, the system will be the same, if not you know, quite radically changed. Um, if you do see a crisis coming, doesn't that make it difficult to ignore that kind of crisis? Because it's hard, as, as, as you said, the reason that, that the Tories are trying to come back is to sort of, uh, I suppose, get ready for the storm. Doesn't that make it hard to sort of raise taxes and fix the collective wage or raise spending because of sort of our lack of saving then that the government has to increase spending if the crisis comes? Do you want to respond to a few points and then maybe go back to an open discussion a little bit? Or? No, is there anything else we can come back on? Okay, I can do. I want to take first the question of Brexit. So <clears throat> I say, yeah, the Brexit vote, like, you can't just ignore it. You can't be like, the Lib Dems used to be like, oh, we're on the second day. Like, you know, I, yeah, there's, there's been a democratic vote, and I think if Corbyn or, or Labour were to come out against that, it would be suicide. But uh, <clears throat> I would say that we, we, would, we have a principal position against the EU. Like, as, as Thomas explained, the EU is not, as it's painted to be, some kind of progressive force like who benefit on workers' rights and all these things. Like, it's set up as a bosses' club, it remains a bosses' club. It's really there for the, the common exploitation of like, the European working class by the bosses of Europe. And predominantly, actually, the, the German working class uh, more than any. And uh, there's obviously a large anti EU moves, uh, not just in Britain, but all across Europe, actually. And that's because, you know, as the crisis uh, deepens, uh, you know, more and more so, actually, the people are coming into conflict with the EU. Like, you know, as you've seen increase, as you've seen Italy, the EU is actually mandating that, that they, they have these austerity budgets and these massive attacks against the workers. And I think the left uh, should actually try and seize this moment. And, uh, and rather than trying to like prop up the EU as uh, the Remain uh, campaign of water, uh, we, we've got to be clear that like, the EU cannot just be reformed in the interests of the working class. Uh, you know, it needs to be completely overhauled. And uh, I think the left should actually come out boldly for a socialist Europe. And I think that would actually get a big echo and, uh, and, and present it on a class basis. And say, so, look, like this, the Leave campaign. Obviously, there's all sorts of uh, lies and misinformation put forward in it. But uh, one of the big uh, like slogans of it was, uh, oh, if we leave the EU, we can take back control. And uh, I say, yeah, okay, all right, it's one thing to take back control from Brussels. But actually, that's only like, really <laughs> just the beginning. You're not really taking back any serious control at all. You're sort of dominated by the world market. And actually, the real control is in the boardrooms of the banks and big businesses. Like, if you really want control over your lives, it's a class question. We need to take over those banks of big businesses, the key leaders of the economy. Uh, that would give us real control over, over our country. And uh, that's why it has to be a socialist Europe. And I think as well, a lot of the anti-EU moves, like in Britain, uh, a lot of people said, like, oh, Brexit, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all, just all about immigration, it's very racist and so on. I'll say, uh, actually, a lot of the anti-immigration moves, is, um, it can be very superficial in, in the sense that you know, where there's massive unemployment, and there's been massive unemployment for, for decades now, or where there's massive housing crisis, you know, the right men come along and they say, well, the reason for this is because immigrants are coming and taking all the jobs, taking all the housing, and so on. If that's not um, combated from the left on a class basis, and, then actually, and, and that's actually copied by the left, by Blairites and people like that, who actually like, echo it, say, yeah, we need to be tough on immigration too, then actually that, that becomes like a the kind of explanation for this. We need to actually come out of the and say, no, it's not immigrants that are the cause of unemployment or the cause of like, bad housing. It's capitalism. Like, capitalism is unable to employ everybody. Uh, they would rather employ fewer people and exploit them harder. It's not more profitable. And the socialism we could share out the work amongst everybody. No loss of pay. We could employ everybody and reduce the working week to like 20 hours or even less. Use machinery to its full, actually automate all the work that we can. And therefore then share out all the necessary work remaining. Uh, nobody would be out of power. 
You know, I'm social, we could actually build houses for ordinary people, not just luxury flats for the rich. Which obviously, if you have a system that's only based for profit, your house building company is only going to build the most profitable uh, flats. Um, so it's those kind of things. If we need to fight it on a class basis, but it means also a revolutionary basis. There's no way you can do that on the basis of capital. Uh, so yeah, we want we we want the solidarity and cooperation across Europe, but it's on a class basis. We don't want the solidarity and cooperation with the bosses exploiting us. We want a working class uh, cooperation, genuine uh, voluntary agreement to actually uh, to, to to take our class forward. And I think that would be extremely popular, and not just in Britain, but all over Europe. Uh, as to the question of um, state nationalisation and workers' control, we well, yeah, someone touched upon it, like the question of like, well, what is a state? And uh, in a nutshell, like ultimately, a state I mean, it hasn't always existed. It's effectively like an organisation of like armed bodies of uh, men to defend the interests of, of a particular ruling class. And throughout history, that ruling class has been a tiny minority of society, uh, having to violently suppress uh, the resistance of the overwhelming majority. And a worker state would be entirely different. It would be the state of the overwhelming majority of society, organised to defend against the resistance of uh, the tiny handful of the former exploiters who want to reassert their control. And uh, by actually taking over the commanding highest of the economy, like the big businesses and banks and so on, and, and transforming them into state property, uh, you're, you're in effect socialising um, those productive forces. But uh, we wouldn't want to, we don't mean nationalisation like, for example, the Labour government in 1945 meant nationalisation, where they just took over certain sections of industry, ran them with the same managers, ran them on a capitalist basis for profit uh, in a very bureaucratic fashion, with no real workers' control, no, ma no planning of the economy or anything like that. That's not what we mean by nationalisation. Uh, we mean actually putting it, as a genuinely having, you know, establishing workers' uh, committees, in the you know, factory committees, workplace committees, in any way, elected delegates, who, uh, on the basis of, you know, mass meetings within those workplaces, actually represent the views uh, and interests of the workers in there, can actually come together and say, well, what, what would be the best use of this factory? What would be the best use of the resources? How can we not just use it in this, this particular workplace, but how can we link up with the rest of the economy, uh, actually on a world scale, uh, and combine everything in the most like, rational and efficient way to, to meet people's needs. And uh, that obviously requires a degree of centralisation. You couldn't just have a whole series of like, workers' cooperatives all just kind of owned by the workers themselves, all trying to effectively compete against each other in, in the form of a market. You need to take things out of the market. You need to be being able to plan things. And that does require uh, an element of, of uh, coordination. Now, obviously, like, planning, we don't envision planning like very bureaucratic planning like you had uh, under Stalinism. We think that the plan needs to involve like, the broadest participation of, uh, of as many workers as possible. Uh, and, but ultimately, that, that you need to have, uh, there will be an element of hierarchy, like not everybody can, can have that like, level of uh, coordination. You're gonna have to elect delegates to um, implement you know, your decisions. But clearly, it has to be democratic. Like, if those elected representatives are not carrying out what they're supposed to do, they should be able to be unelected and replaced by people who will do that job. They should also be regularly rotated, so that you know if everybody is a bureaucrat, nobody's a bureaucrat, and so on. So I think it will be far more democratic. It will be far more beneficial to have that kind of setup, because uh, the the alternative is at the moment you have company directors not ele elected by anybody controlling the fate of billions of people across the world in the interests of a tiny minority of uh, of the rich. Um, then on the question of, uh, <coughs> I just thought it was an interesting point you meant about the, after the crisis in 2008, it was essentially like a kind of calm before the storm. And I think that's right. I think there's an almost kind of lagging consciousness really between like the economic situation and the kind of people's understanding of it and, and the kind of tasks ahead. And I think initially in that period, you could see workers were kind of in shock and kind of like, well, what do we do? Like, maybe if we keep our heads down. Maybe if we don't kind of uh, cause a fuss, you know, we'll, we'll hang on to our jobs and we'll be alright. Um, but you know that obviously is impossible. People are coming are coming under massive attack by the ruling class, and people have to fight back. And austerity began to be implemented at least in Britain in late 2010, and then you did see the beginnings of a massive fight back. There were huge mobilisations, and uh, throughout whole of 2011, there was a massive wave of strikes. The biggest wave of strikes since. Uh, the 1970s, or even actually uh, since the general strike in 1926, there was a day when you had three million workers out on strike uh, all at once. And uh, there was enormous energy to, to fight that struggle. 
The problem was it was led by people who were not interested in finding it to the finish, but interested in compromising with the government and trying to pour cold water all over it. And they actually dampened that move, uh, kind of led to a kind of a defeat and led to enormous de demoralization. And that set the class struggle back actually for a number of years, where not the kind of not much seemed to be happening. But I say under the surface there was a build-up of enormous anger and frustration. And it kind of it found an expression later on with Brexit. And it's now found an expression through the Corbyn movement, which is is uh, the struggle is no longer kind of on the industrial plane, it's, it's gone on the political plane. I think that's now like the, the, the kind of the key kind of uh, focal point of the class struggle in Britain. Uh, and then just finally the, the question of um, a new crisis, uh, you know, is it going to be uh, difficult to implement left-wing uh, policies if uh, we have a further um, two-quarter slump? And I'll say uh, yes, if, if your idea of left-wing program is simply just to try to patch up capitalism and try to reform it, and try to have a kind of nice, kind of friendly, humane version of capitalism, then yes, that's impossible. There's no, there's no ability to do that on the basis of, uh, of, of the worldwide crisis of capitalism. I say not even in a future crisis, even now, no government in the world is, uh, is implementing mm -hmm. reforms, they're implementing counter-reform, they're undoing all the gains of the past period that the working class has won through struggle, whether it's in Greece, whether it's in France, whether it's in Spain, it's just, all these governments are implementing austerity, which is what is, what is required by, by the dictates of the market, and by the fact that there is no money in the bank, or the governments uh, are running enormous deficits, they're completely up to the neck in, in debt, and they'll go bankrupt unless they cut back. And uh, it just shows the complete inability to actually manage capitalism. Uh, there was a, a, a period before, uh, on the basis of the post-war boom, when the economy was going forward, workers could, could uh, go on strike, go on struggle, and the, the bosses could throw some crumbs off the table. That doesn't exist now. And we've got to be quite clear that the, the period ahead of us, there is no way to kind of just catch up capitalism. If we're going to implement any of the good things in, in Corbyn's programme, by you know, building the you know, millions of houses, or you're having uh, free tuition, or, or all these kind of things, it's going to require breaking with the market and actually taking uh, both political and economic power out of the hands of this tiny elite of people, this, this gang of capitalists who you know, run society for their own narrow interests, not for anybody else. We need to take it out of them. They've shown that they're incapable to take society forward. Uh, for the bulk of people across the world, it's just uh, misery upon misery, uh, poverty, unemployment, you know, zero hours contracts and all these things. We've got to say enough's enough. We're not going to pay a penny more for, for the crisis so that these billionaires can, can continue to get richer and richer. And uh, I think such a, a bold program against them, as I said, is clearly enormously popular. It's not an isolated phenomenon called in Britain. Look at Bernie Sanders in the USA. Uh, look at uh, like Podemos in, uh, in Spain or even Syriza before they uh, got into government. People are looking for some kind of uh, alternative. And uh, I think if we actually had a, a very bold fighting socialist program, is clearly a uh, thirst for that. Clearly, people are fed up with uh, the status quo. People want to transform their lives. We've got to, we've got to come up, come forward as Marxists and so forth. If we, if we want to do this, we have to break with capitalism. The only way to do that is, is through a socialist revolution. So we actually want to play. Um, it's been a great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much. Got one next week on the Paris Commune. Yeah, next Thursday. Thursday. Thank you. So come along there. Um, I think we've got about like 10 to 15 minutes left, so any final points, questions can be literally on anything we've heard tonight, or, or anything at all really, on to do with socialism, Marxism, the Labour Party, uh, where is Britain going, the world economic crisis, or really anything that crosses your mind. Um, there you go. Yes? So, I'm a bit confused. I don't understand uh, whether, no, do you believe that Corbyn is against capitalism? I mean, from what you're saying, I, th I think it's clear that you believe that Corbyn is against capitalism. And uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit um, awkward. And, and also, I think the, the question of, um, uh, we didn't, I don't know his name, the question of uh, the guy there was um, how you reconcile the fact that uh, you have a capitalist crisis, so um, again and again, so you are, <coughs> we are heading to the next crisis. And uh, also the Marxian uh, economics, uh, you know, describe how this uh, is happening. For example, in, uh, in the third uh, volume of uh, the capital, you have the counterfactual movement. So 
One of them is the destruction of capital. Uh, so if you are a Marxist, if you are a Marxist and you believe in, uh, in this kind of ideas, I think it's definitely you are going to have some kind of destruction of capital. And I, I can understand, uh, you know, uh, how you, you can be a Marxist and uh, at the same time believe that some, uh, you know, kind of some ideas like uh, uh, building uh, houses or uh, you know, building uh, jobs or all these uh, things uh, can work in capital because, uh, as I said, the capital in order to you know regain its power has to dis to to to, uh, to to destroy capital. Okay, um, I, I can get uh, you know how this uh, work together. I, mean, I think I would actually respond to that. I think one of the key elements, uh, really emphasize and just a uh, kind of drill this point home that there's no way, unless Corbyn has a massive change of heart, maybe comes across an old copy of Das Kapital and uh, completely changes his political opinions um, and move behind him, that Corbyn will, you know, break with capitalism. And because Corbyn will not break with capitalism, he'll be unable to implement any of the reforms that are currently into his programme, uh, when he does gain government, or if he does gain government. And this creates, this creates an antagonistic situation. Corbyn is elected uh, in this scenario, into uh, you know uh, into power into uh, charge of the state uh, with a let's say majority a large majority etc says he's going to you know bring back uh, free school meals and stuff like that says he's going to you know uh, fund the NHS massively he's going to accomplish all of these things etc and they're all pretty lovely and things you know no one would disagree about no one would disagree with higher wages uh, low working hours fair public services and all that uh, something as much you know we're completely for but. Ultimately, they'll come across the contradictions of the capitalist system. They'll see that the capitalist will not invest because it is not profitable. Um, they'll see they'll be unwilling to take away these huge stocks of capital there. They'll likely do a capital strike against them. Now, the question is, is that if he is at that point unwilling to break with capitalism, he will be unable to implement his program. He'll then have two choices. Either A, if there are very large sections and a large Marxist and revolutionary organisation uh, behind him in this specific situation, which can put pressure and actually force him to break with the capitalist system, to implement socialism, to uh, you know democratize the means of production. Uh, so often put those in the power of the working class. In which case, he will be able to implement them. In which case, we'll have a socialist revolution. Or in the other case, he will completely then uh, turn away uh, many of his supporters. He will have you know shown the limitations of reformism and will force many of his supporters to look even farther to the left. Um, to actually, you know, and let's say to break break away with that and to draw those revolutionary conclusions. I think it's similar to, let's say, again, um, you know, what happened with the Socialist Party in uh, the Spanish Civil War. They originally actually, like, effectively, relatively reformed. Uh, but, you know, they kept coming into these contradictions of capitalism, and more and more people in that group uh, started to look even further to the left. They actually initially went to Trotsky. Uh, but the Trotskyists refused to talk to them because they said, oh no, you've got reformist ideals, abandoned them. And so they actually then ended up going to the Stalinists, who effectively used the then Spanish Civil War to defend the Soviet Union, etc. And I think that's a similar situation which we could very well see play out through the Corbyn movement. Uh, Corbyn effectively, you know, either is in a situation where he puts forward through his reforms by adopting socialism, by abolishing the capitalist system, or he fails to put through his reforms and forces all of the support, these 600,000 people who joined the Labour Party, the uh, mil tens of millions of people who voted for Labour uh, yesterday, um, to start drawing even more out of the conclusions where you can suddenly see uh, revolutionary movements uh, you know, spring up in the masses. And I would see this is suspect of that. Of course, being very, very harsh, that Corbyn is only a part to a socialist revolution. He is not the implementer, um, and he's not the end of but simply a stepping stone which must be made. On that um, point, um, the fact that Corbyn being a stepping stone, do you feel that um, the situation we're in at the moment when uh, the Conservatives and the UP will probably form a, a coalition of chaos, do you feel that that might, people will see how chaotic this is, how ine ineffectual it is, and be pushed further to the left? So, so is it do you feel it's likely that the current result, this coalition of chaos, might actually be better for Marxist societies and make a socialist revolution seem more likely and more imminent than, say, the Corbyn movement? Um, sort of 
considering that um, Maine does have a majority now, how like much of an impact can Corbyn actually make? Do you think he will be able to like claim some kind of government, or do you think he's just going to kind of keep pushing and never really? Yeah, just kind of like following on from that, I think one of the key, really key elements to you know, put forward is that the current situation in which capitalism is in, it means that it kind of doesn't matter what many people do. We are going to continue to see uh, drops in you know, real wages. We're going to continue to see attacks on the working class, longer working hours, people finding it hard to get a job, people having a uh, poor and quality standard of living. And in these situations, it is forces polarisation. It forces more people to adopt more and more radical and desperate platforms. When it comes down to it, nine out of ten people don't particularly want a revolution. They just want to kind of, you know, sit at home, get a nice life, uh, you know, have like a got white picket house and something like that. You know, just sit and watch Netflix all day. But the current capitalist system doesn't allow such an easy life. It forces people to act. It forces people to find more and more, uh, you know, revolutionary alternatives. I think this is a key thing with, uh, you know, in how let's say the current results will do that is the entire reason the election was called was to try and mend over the instability which has been caused by the economic crisis. However, it's done the complete reverse. It's turned it into the opposite and made it even more unstable. There, again, there's Callum points out, you know, there's, there's no way May is going to hold it together. There's no way the DUP is going to do all that. And then an election with it, you know, it's now just a betting get a man's game, isn't it, of when the next election is going to be. Uh, you know, is it going to be six, uh, six months, a year, two years? It will happen at some point. Um, and it will happen on a continuing uh, polarising platform. People continue, continue to search for better ways out because there can't be any counter reforms, there can't be any reforms given to ease the crisis, to ease people's standard of living because capitalism is unable to achieve that. Um, as in this case, which will continually drive people forward, which will drive, let's say, you know, people more towards COVID and more further left than that. And of course, in the same point, the ruling class will find themselves being driven more towards. Uh, you know, uh, further extreme policies. I mean, one of the most extreme things which we're seeing for quite a while is a continued thing by, uh, you know, elements of the ruling class pushing the idea that of uh, actually breaking with, you know, labour and the conservatives of the two-party system. Again, if you uh, read The Economist, it's quite fun. Uh, <laughs> quite fun to read bourgeois publications when they're, they're all just completely terrified. Of. They constantly see, oh yeah, look, at we'll vote for the Lib Dems because it's an endowment that we can basically get the best elements of the Tories, get the best elements of Labour, put them all together and have a radical centre. Well, I mean, the reason, let's say, they don't do that in the first place a hundred years ago is because it's a essential element for political stability to be able to send people off to the Labour Party every time the Tories get uh, to have crushed the ruling class too much. You know, to actually even be considered breaking like that is an extreme action in itself. Well, let's kind of give it a few more years when, you know, let's say, you actually see mass strikes when you start to see uh, uh, you know, general strike, etc. You can see a ruling class becoming increasingly faced with uh, you know, more and more extreme actions um, in that sense. But the key element point here is that once you continue to have this capitalist crisis, there's continue to be no reforms on capitalism, the situation continues to be unstable, it continues to polarise people, and leads only and surely in one direction, either socialism or barbarism.
It actually now it looks uh, better than we are heading to Barbary. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's, we're, we're a long way off. Sometimes the poor people don't, uh, no, they don't resist. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, having poor, you know, more people poor and poor, and it doesn't mean that uh, they're gonna fight back. And... Well, I think uh, what you see is that you know you get um, situations where you know, let's say, defeats do lead to demoralization. I think. Yeah. Uh, I imagine you're referring to again what happened in Greece after 2015. But to and again that does you know strengthen the hand of barbarism, etc. Which is why we need to, you know, in a situation in Britain where we still have a few years, uh, where we still have maybe quite a bit of time actually before these crises start to get to its extreme points, to actually build and build revolutionary organization to avoid this. But also, you also see that even when at the period of defeat. This doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you know, it's a defeat, it's forever gone, the chance to be lost, etc. Again, another really interesting thing you see when analysing the Spanish Civil War and uh, the 1930 uh, in general, is you see that you had periods of quite drastic defeat, um, but they then, of reaction, etc. They would then give way to even stronger uh, progress towards us, essentially. Uh, between 1934 and 1936 uh, were the years of black reaction. Uh, they were then followed by the Spanish Revolution, by uh, you know Brazil, uh, Barcelona going under, effectively uh, being run by Soviets and communes, etc. Uh, and this you know, immense uh, you know, workers' collectives and workers' democracy, etc. Uh, similarly, you know, in, let's say um, in Lenin uh, in 1917, the working class had actually been quite defeated and quite destroyed. You didn't see the perspective of revolution in January. In February, they were thrown aside. So eight months later, uh, nine months later. They uh, overthrow the provisional government, stuff like this. You know, there isn't just a thing that you know. There's a defeat here. People come demoralised. People they regain the fight. It's only in a truly horrific situations when the working class are permanently defeated. At that point, you know, and that's when you start to end up talking about you know, actual fascist forces and whatnot. And uh, you know, the things we saw in around the 1940s and late 1930s. But we are far, far from anything approaching that situation yet. Which gives an even greater impetus for revolutionary movements, for movements like the IMT to build, to actually organise and to get involved in these uh, movements and struggles, to be able to win people over and actually create the ground uh, for a successful socialist revolution, to make sure it ends up in socialism, and to avoid the situation of, well, <coughs> further barbarism. I mean, it should be ignored. I mean, millions of people are currently starving around the globe, um, and there's a damage being done. anyone else have any final points or comments? Okay, in which case uh, I will give it to James to give a closing, but just before I do that, um, so James has come all the way from London after a heavy night watching the elections, a four hour meeting discussing them, and then on a train and then a bus. Um, unfortunately, Richard Branson didn't give him a nice, you know, like £100 to do this journey or whatever. Um, and has yet to reply to our appeals to uh, back the international market tendency. We'll keep writing, but um, seems unlikely. On that basis, we asked that if everyone could give a small donation uh, to, you know, let's say, just help with the travel, etc. That would be uh, fantastic. Um, I'm going to send this lovely bag round. Um, you could do a see through one to give you a gift, but it seems like that. Furthermore, um, Again, if you've enjoyed this talk, please do get involved and uh, please talk to us afterwards. We'll be heading to the Dirty Duck to continue discussing all the events going on, all Marxist theory and whatnot. Uh, feel free to uh, take a copy of the magazine or paper um, or our pamphlets, etc. And also, again, speak to Barnaby if you are interested in the Save Our Statue campaign, uh, which will be uh, going on and uh, things like that. Uh, but yeah, until then, uh, James. All right, I'll try and keep this brief because I was really talking about this. Um, I'm sorry if you, I think you might have misunderstood me if, if you think that I think Corbyn is an like, anti capitalist or uh, a Marxist who is going to be leading the British Revolution. Uh, I would like to think that he would do that. If I'm honest, I don't think he is going to do it. Uh, I think as Marxists, we would uh, use what we would call like a methodist, uh, someone who thinks that you can just kind of just. Have a nice managed capitalism if you just like kind of tinker with it here and 
trying to tax the rich a bit and borrow a bit more money. So it's a Keynesian program, really, uh, uh, cool. uh, which is, has nothing to do with the interests of the, work, the working class, but is about trying to patch capitalism up and, and keep it stable in the interests of uh, the capitalists. Uh, the thing with Corbyn, though, is we have to take the class struggle like as we find it and not as we wish it to be. And, and clearly in Britain, like the class struggle is clearly focused around Corbyn. It's the, it's the biggest thing to happen politically for the working class for generations. And the, the genuine mass movement, I think the fact that you've got now 600,000 people who recently joined the Labour Party uh, is unprecedented. You have to go back to maybe the 1950s or 40s to find such a level of membership. And um, that is really like where this uh, this anger against uh, the system is, is being expressed in its initial stages. Now, it's not that doesn't mean that everybody uh, joining the Labour Party or you know, voting for Corbyn thinks they're voting to overthrow capitalism or you know, ignore the uh, socialist revolution. Uh, they're voting because they want better wages and somewhere decent to live and you know to not to pay tuition fees and things like this. The point that we have to make is that like all these kind of things are not possible. This period under the capitalism, it's going to be a hell of a struggle to try and implement that program uh, when Corbyn comes to power. And obviously, like as the task of Marxists is to intervene in that struggle, not stand aside from it, but to actually uh, stand side by side with these people who have allegiance to reformism, and actually uh, patiently explain the limits of that and the need to actually uh, completely break with the system. And that that means we need to be there and uh, and, uh, and participate in that struggle. At the moment, that struggle is, is within the Labour Party, uh, with Corbyn on one side and the Blairites on the other. Um, <clears throat> as to the coalition of chaos leading to um, crisis, I agree. I think that the Tory party is uh, going to massively uh, discredit itself through power. Uh, I agree with what you said. I think it's going to be extremely unstable. I, I don't think it will last particularly long. Um, the issue of Brexit, I think, will shipwreck it. Uh, and also, I think as well that um, it's fair to say, I think there are a lot of illusions amongst a, a layer of people in Britain that Brexit is going to transform uh, their lives, it's going to make things better. Uh, and I think actually, if, if we're honest about it, it's actually going to make things worse if, like, if it's just on a capitalist basis. Because the, uh, the bill for Brexit is going to be presented to the working class. Uh, you know, people are going to have even further attacks on their jobs and their wages and so forth. And um, I think all that kind of uh, enthusiasm for the Tories, who they saw as like you know the party of Brexit, and, like standing up for workers and so on, is going to very rapidly turn to its opposite. There's going to be enormous hatred against them, and that's going to lead to further polarisation. I think even bigger swing to the left. And that's why I think Corbyn needs to prepare for that now. Uh, we can't say exactly when it's going to happen, but I think it's it's not a, necessarily a question of years, but it's it's, it's more more an immediate uh, thing. And that's why we need to to get active in the struggle right away. Uh, as to Corbyn's impact, obviously, well, um, yeah, I think it's unlikely that they would form a government. I so said I don't rule it out, but I think that it's more likely that they'll try and form a Tory DP one. Uh, and of course, Corbyn would be uh, act as an opposition in Parliament. But so like, that's obviously one thing, but it's not the real. Uh, it's not going to be where the real struggle is. I think. I think uh, what you would do is embolden actually a massive increase in the class struggle, like in the industrial struggle, like in the workplaces, you know, on the streets and so forth. Because I mean, people have had their heads down for years actually, and thought kind of like, well, you know, what, what can we do? We need to, you know, we've got all these attacks on us, and how can we fight it? But I think now actually people want to be much more confident. I think there's a, a Labour Party with leadership which is on their side, which does have a, a prospect of taking power in the not too distant future. And I think people will, uh, will begin to fight back on, on a much higher level. And I think those kind of things are going to further undermine the government, paralyse it, and actually it could, at a point, uh, bring it down. Like you saw in uh, the mid-1970s, uh, there was a minor strike which brought down the Tory government. Uh, those kind of things, I think, are actually like, the kind of perspective that we're entering into. Um, <laughs> but that's if Corbyn offers a fighting, bold lead. If he... If he does what he did after last year's leadership election, where he kind of said, okay, well, I've won this with a massive landslide, but actually, no, now we're just going to have unity and peace with the Blairites, and let's all try and get along. That's going to pour cold water. I think he needs to come out fighting and say, no, look, this is it now. We're not, there's none, none of this uh, kind of Blairite way. We're going to fight for you know, hard socialist policies. And uh, we need to be involved in that. And uh, I think if we, 
we get a group of you know, thousands of solid Marxists fighting for a bold program and well organized in that movement, we could actually have a massive impact and become a huge uh, point of attraction on the fact of that situation. And then just finally on the question of uh, should we be demoralized and like this society heading towards barbarism? I actually uh, feel the opposite. I would say that like, these kind of events that we've seen, this election, should not at all lead us to demoralization. It actually should give us enormous optimism in that you can see the beginnings of the stirrings of like, a, a mass movement. And uh, it, it could, it, I would say we're at still at the beginning stage of this process of uh, what is ultimately going to be like a revolutionary process, and not just in Britain, but across the world. People are absolutely uh, fed, sick to death of uh, the status quo. People are, are not happy in their lives. People are you know, up to the neck with stress and, and debt and poverty, all these things. And they're looking for some kind of uh, way out. And uh, this, this election shows that far from being uh, toxic and unelectable, left-wing ideas, socialist uh, policies are enormously popular and are now back in the mainstream. And I think this is, this is as I say, just the, the first uh, beginnings of, of creating actually a mass uh, kind of socialist party in Britain. So uh, I would not be at all demoralised by this. I say the, the, the reason for a lot of defeats ultimately comes down to a question of leadership. I see uh, over the last few years, you've seen workers in one country after another prepared to fight to the end to actually change society and, uh, and transform things. Greece is a very good example of this. But then they've then been essentially blocked by their own leadership. So rather than actually taking that, that struggle to the end and actually challenging capitalism, uh, the, the, the crucial moment, capitulate and end up betraying. And I think that's the lesson we've got to learn. That's the lesson of uh, the whole of the, the class struggle for the last hundred years or so. Is that you know, we've had situations where the working class could have taken power like that, but because of their own leadership, have been frustrated. That's why we have to, to build up a new leadership, a revolutionary leadership. And I don't mean one person or kind of one, a handful of people, but leaders in every single workplace, in every single neighborhood, who have a solid grasp of, uh, of the class struggle, a solid grasp of like, what are the next steps? How do we take this, uh, this situation further? And how ultimately do we take power and actually transform the world? And that is, that is what we're doing in the IMT, and that is what I would encourage everyone here to get involved with.